Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Audra Kruger, and I'm the executive director of the Poppers First organization. Um, welcome. Uh, today, we're going to talk about rural labor force development. Um, we're going to start uh, today talking about the fish industry. I'm very excited about this. I've got a new interest in the fish industry in Canada. So uh, we have Rick Williams from the Canadian Council of Professional Fish Harvesters here to present to us today. Um, he was part of a major um, study done on the state of affairs of the fishery in um, Canada. So um, without uh, further delay, uh, Rick, please uh, take the mic. Thank you. Okay, my thanks to the foundation for inviting me. We just completed this study in the late spring, early summer, and uh, so I'm in the late addition to the agenda. Uh, you'll find uh, research outcomes relevant to your wider concern for rural revitalization. The first slide to get into is uh, I'm the research director for the Canadian Council of Professional Fish Harvesters. The council is a national human resources sector council uh, set up with HRDC funding in the 1990s. We've been operating since uh, the mid-90s. Uh, and basically, we're not an advocacy uh, organization. We're there to do research and policy development and program development so on around human resources issues. Um, so this, I'm reporting today, uh, and, and I should say the council, the membership of the council is comprised of most of the more significant harvest organizations across Canada, um, including in the, uh, in the uh, total. Um, and uh, I'm here to report on a study just completed, $1.7 million funding from Employment and Social Development Canada. Uh, the objectives of the study were basically to kind of update our knowledge about the state of the labor force in the fish harvesting industry in Canada, uh, and to uh, develop explore strategies for attracting uh, more labor supply to the industry, uh, and to attract and retain people for careers in the industry. Um, and, and I'm just going to, the major findings of the study, it was a three-year study with all kinds of different uh, surveys and data analysis and regional consultations, case studies, and so on. But I'll just give you the bottom line, what, what we're saying in our report about the, the, uh, the industry. Um, uh, first and foremost, the fishing industry in Canada, which many people would, uh, when asked about it off the top, would say, oh, it's been in decline for a long period of time, it's a crisis industry, et cetera. Um, we, you know, amassed fairly uh, convincing evidence that the fishing industry is in fact uh, going through a period of sustained uh, growth, uh, economic expansion, uh, has been since the 1990s, in spite of the collapse of the ground fish industry on the Atlantic coast and uh, of the several uh, salmon fisheries on the west coast. Uh, nevertheless, the industry has uh, has survived those uh, challenges, and uh, and as you'll see, is expanding in economic terms, not necessarily in terms of employment. Um, so we're looking in our report and making the argument in the report that the fishery is a uh, holds significant potential for driving uh, economic renewal, rural revitalization, and coastal regions primarily of Canada. Uh, secondly, our, major, our second major finding is that the biggest constraint or risk in terms of not achieving that potential is on the human resources side. The fishery is uh, experiencing the same kind of overall demographic and population uh, mobility uh, challenges that most rural industries across Canada and most rural communities across Canada are facing. So the real limitation on our ability to harvest this significant growth in value of fisheries may well be on the people side, not on the fish side. Our third um, major finding, which will be very familiar to people here uh, from the agriculture sector, is that one of the biggest challenges to attract the uh, challenges for att attracting and retaining young people to careers in the industry is that because the fish in the water is growing in value so rapidly and significantly, the price, the cost of the access rights to fish, uh, to harvest that fish, are also growing, i.e. licenses and quotas. Uh, so young people working in the industry 
over the last 20 years have had de de declining capacities to buy into the enterprises on which they work as the owners, owner operators of those enterprises retire up at, at an accelerating pace. Uh, in the study, we explore a concept, um, a, a traditional notion of occupational pluralism. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the pattern of in rural communities of people working in different, you know, in different industries, generating income from different occupations across different seasons over the year. And we started out by asking the question, uh, is that still a big part of how people, how the labor force is sustained in the fish harvesting industry? And what role does it play? And what we discovered, you know, using tax filer data from Stats Canada, is that not only is it a persistent, a continuing part of how the labor force sustains itself, but it's actually increased quite significantly over the 15 to 20 year period of our study. Uh, so occupational pluralism is a continuing reality, uh, and the, the way it's, it's taking shape today is that uh, younger people with higher levels of education are much more occupationally mobile. Uh, so we consider the possibility that we should be looking at occupational pluralism in a very positive way as a strategic option for attracting people uh, to life in our rural communities. <clears throat> I'll say more about that at the end. And then our final, there are a number of other findings I won't touch on here, but uh, our concluding chapter is about how complex these issues are and how a, a very um, ambitious and uh, a complex uh, approach is needed to change things around. So just to show you a little bit of the, uh, our, our, the evidence supporting these conclusions, the uh, Minister Morneau, when the new government came in in 2015, appointed uh, Dominic Barton to lead an advisory council on economic growth. And they identified uh, expansion of exports as key to Canada's economic outlook. And then within that emphasis on exports, they identified what they call ag food, the entire uh, sort of spectrum of food producing uh, industries. As, one of the, as a growth sector with some of the most significant potential, uh, related in large part to the growth in global demand, the rise and expansion of the middle class in Asia, and all those things we're familiar with. So ag food in general is uh, identified as a growth area. The fishing industry within that is a small part of that, represents in Canada in terms of exports, represents less than 10% of total ag food exports. But it has some unique characteristics. And talking here, our study is only about the wild fish fishery. No, it doesn't include aquaculture. And the unique characteristic of um, wild fish industry is that we harvest, we're the last kind of thing in the last industry in the world that harvests a, a, a natural uh, population of animals. Um, and we have over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, through many ups and downs, uh, reaching the point of uh, harvesting sustainably, that uh, barring major changes in climate and, and other factors, it, it's very unlikely that overfishing will, will be a cause of dramatic declines in the overall fishery. Certain stocks go up and down all the time, but we are now, generally speaking, harvesting commercial stocks at sustainable levels. And there's a lot of detail in there which you went to in question. So if we have a fixed supply and the industry is coming to terms with the fact that growth in the industry in future and growth of harvester incomes is not going to come from catching more fish. It's going to come from adding value to that fish or adding or primarily through quality assurance steps but other means as well. So if we have a fixed supply of a product for which there is rapidly expanding global demand and the algorithm that works here is that the value of that product is going to keep going up. And we've already seen that in the last 20 years. So for those two reasons, we're making the argument that even more so than most other ag food or all other ag food sectors, the fishery is going to generate, uh, that its products are going to be more and more valuable. So just looking at the 2013 to 2017 period, uh, in, the, in Canada as a whole, in constant dollar terms, the value of seafood exports has increased by 10% a year. Uh, in Atlantic 
Canada and Quebec by 11% and Nova Scotia by 14% a year. Now, over that period of time, um, ag food exports grew annually by 6% a year. So the, the rate of growth in cost of dollars is impressive across the whole sec ag food sector, but fisheries is uh, unique. Anyway, and then you compare that with rate of growth of overall exports from all sectors uh, in the Atlantic, Canada, and Quebec area. It's 2%, and for Canada, it's a whole 2%. So we are already seeing kind of the uh, unique kind of aspect. And one of the positive things that's happening is our markets for seafood are diversifying. The United States uh, in 2000 took 71% of our exports, obviously dominant. That percentage, the, the the actual value and quantity of exports has gone up significantly to the U.S. since then, but as a proportion of total exports fallen off to 63%. China, is, when over that period of time, grew from about hundred million to a billion dollars in exports, and that's 2016. We know that figure has gone up about 20% since then. And other regions, Eastern Europe, particularly uh, Latin America, are also expanding their demand for Canadian seafood exports. So we are diversifying at the time as we're adding value. That is now translating through into significantly improved incomes for people in the industry. The, uh, using tax filer data, this is an average for everybody in the industry. Everybody, any person in Canada who received earned taxable income from fish harvesting um, so in New Brunswick, there was a 300% increase. The average income from fish harvesting is $45,000 a year. And we're talking about a seasonal industry here. For most people, an industry of less than three months. Uh, in Nova Scotia, 41,000 for land, 29,000 uh, Quebec, 46. So uh, for Canada as a whole, it's around uh, 37,000. So people are earning uh, nowadays, uh, what could be considered to be, you know, for rural communities, very solid uh, family incomes in a seasonal industry. And those are averages, so there's going to be a lot of uh, inequality in there between crew members and enterprise owners. So that's a kind of a picture of what's happening on the growth side, the economic side of the industry. When you look at all the factors that, that impact on labor supply to the industry, uh, all we see there is negatives. Uh, we document this uh, a lot in the report. Uh, the, the, the demographics, the aging of the workforce, uh, urbanization trends, interprovincial and international migration trends, and labor market competition trends are, have all been, over the last 20 years, uh, operating to the detriment of fish harvesting. Um, just looking quickly at the age profile, for example, um, in, this is in uh, Nova Scotia, which is the health, has the healthiest kind of labor force of, of, of all the provinces. Um, we saw a drop from 45 to 26 percent in the 30 to 44 age category, 2001 to 2016. This is census data. And this will be, again, familiar to people who come from the agriculture sector. When you see that kind of a drop from 45% of the workforce to 26% in that category, what you're seeing is young families uh, leaving the, the industry, but probably leaving rural communities as well. That's the scariest part of this picture. The 31% of the workforce that's now over 54 in the fish harvesting industry, that means you've got one foot and three toes out of the boat because people don't last that long. Um, that's a concern, but the biggest concern to me is what's happening to that core uh, young family age group who represent the future of the industry. If you look at Newfoundland, we're at crisis proportions with 41% of the workforce over the age of 54 and only 9% in the new entrant category uh, under 30 years of age. And again, that huge drop in the young family age group. This is uh, Ray Bowman's uh, report uh, done for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Many of you are pretty familiar with it, I'm sure. Um, very quickly, what this is really describing is that for every 100, 100 people who retire out of industry, out of uh, employment in the rural region, 
Newfoundland, there are only 63 young people in those communities to replace them, meaning 27 jobs will go unfilled. In Nova Scotia, 25 jobs will go unfilled in rural regions. In Brunswick, 30 jobs. And in Canada, 19 jobs will go unfilled. That defines very concretely the kind of level and scale of the challenge that we're facing. So in the fish harvesting sector, 40% of our current workforce is, is almost certain to retire by 2025 based on age profile. So in most regions, there are insufficient younger people in the industry and insufficient potential new entrants in the community to replace the people who are going to retire over the next decade. Of course, there is a more positive outlook in regions like Manitoba, where the, um, most of the workforce is indigenous and parts of British Columbia as well. You know, automation, the answer that economists will give to this is, well, that's not a problem, that's a solution. We'll just have more efficient, more productive enterprises, uh, even more automation, et cetera. And, but even the, the kind of, as again, in agriculture, you're very familiar, the, the trade-off there is that if you go to higher skilled occupations to run your industry, it's more of a challenge to attract those people to your rural communities to live. The wage, the, the, the economic incentives, but also the quality of life issues, the service standards, et cetera. Uh, so we really need, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, we need to reverse 30 years of, of labor shedding in our fishing communities if we're going to continue to harvest the value that's there in the water. The three priorities in the fishing industry are improved capacities of enterprise to compete in the labor market, i.e. better wages and working conditions, include safety, uh, but also it has to do with communities, the quality of services in communities, etc. Because the new labor supply is not going to come from within communities, it has to be drawn from outside. Uh, the second thing is more access to capital and other supports for intergenerational transfer of enterprises. And the third thing is to explore this idea of occupational pluralism. Can we make uh, employment and careers in rural regions more attractive generally? by linking up opportunities, uh, well-paying opportunities across seasons in different uh, occupational sectors. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna pull it up to the level of kind of rural industries, seasonal industries generally, because I know that's the concern here with the foundation. Um, this is a, a quote from the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, report, the results of consultation from the development of next agricultural policy framework. I read a number of reports from the agriculture sector that you could just change the words of the farmers and replace fishermen and you'd be talking about the same thing in terms of average age profile, intergenerational transfer issues, access to capital issues, etc. So this isn't what we're talking about in the fishing industry is not a fishing industry problem. It's a rural regions problem. It's a, it's a demographic challenge generally. Uh, it's a regional development challenge generally. Um, and it won't be solved just within the fishing industry any more than just within the way you run agricultural enterprises will solve the problem there. <coughs> In Ray, Ray Bowman's report to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities estimates that 30% of Canada's GDP is generated in the rural regions of Canada uh, in terms of how he defines rural regions. And our research and research by sector councils in Quebec indicates that 25% of Canada's GDP is generated by industries that rely on seasonal labor supply or episodic labor supply, you know, those kind of projects that only last for a year or two years. And then people are, uh, are not only are thrown out of employment, they have to move to some other construction project or some other mining project or whatever. So we do not have a strong policy program framework in Canada to support that kind of a labor force beyond the, the EI system, which was last kind of really significantly reformed in the 1950s, it was retrenched in the 1990 um, to address the issue of seasonal and episodic employment. So uh, following from the, the, uh, 
the Dominic Barton report to Minister Morrow. They, that set in motion a bunch, a, a number of what are called Canada's economic strategy tables. Just a month ago, they came out with their report on ag food, in which they set a goal that by 2025, Canada will, will be one of the top five competitors in the agri-food sector of the world, and et cetera, et cetera. They, they see this as a growth sector, uh, but we do not have the policy and program instruments to sustain it on the labor supply, labor force. Side. So I think it's on the basis of these kinds of trends and developments, we really need to start to challenge the increasingly urban centric bias in Canadian public policy to deal with sustainability challenges for rural seasonal industries and communities. There's no, I would make the argument that there has been no significant new national policy commitment on rural labor market development since the UI reforms in the 50s. Uh, and rural labor markets are now characterized by jobs with no workers uh, and workers, aging workers, uh, who are not really the right people to move over into the jobs that are available, don't have the skills, etc. cetera. Um, so that is a challenge that, again, is unique or needs innovative approaches. And we can't attract new labor supply to regions with inadequate education and healthcare services, uh, which raises a whole other set of questions. And we can't expect people to emigrate to regions and otherwise highly uh, economically viable industries if they're just going to be second class citizens. And the report is available as a download from the Canadian Council, and I'll leave up the website where you can get access to it. With that, we finished in good time. So uh, with that, I would like to invite Laurie Brickow up to the podium. Um, she comes from the University of Prince Edward Island, um, and her paper is titled Recruiting Talent to PEI Results of the Survey. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Audra. This is the All Maritime Panel. We're all through the Maritimes. So um, it'll come up there in a minute. I'm Lori Brinklow with the Institute of Island Studies at the University of Prince Edward Island. I'm the coordinator of the Institute, which is about 35 years old now, um, doing rural, um, well, not necessarily rural, but island based research, environment, culture that sort of thing. Um, this paper, I am doing it in collaboration with my boss, Jim Randall. Um, he was the principal investigator on this particular research project that we did for the Department of Workforce and Advanced Learning, recruiting talent to PEI. So this is something, as we've heard already, is an issue in um, rural um, Canada, the problem of um, depopulation. So I thought that this, particular conference would be a good place to tell you about this project that we worked on in collaboration with the department and perhaps maybe it'll be something that people might like to um, take on, take back and adapt it to their own environment. So that one, yes, there's Prince Edward Island. I think there might be a few people in the audience who've been to Prince Edward Island. We hosted the Surf uh, and North Atlantic Forum Conference in 2015 in the Summerside. I was the chair. The Institute of Island Studies, um, in collaboration with Surf, took on the uh, partnership of hosting the conference, and it was, a, I think, a grand success. Um, you can see that in the middle is um, Charlottetown, which is the biggest central area of the, um, of the urban center and the rest we have a small city of Summerside of about 15,000 people. Charlottetown is in the neighboring 40, 42,000 I think and then the rest you can see is small communities, small rural communities. And of course that might be one way you would get to the island over the Confederation Bridge. You might fly, you might take the ferry in the summertime. In 1999, the Institute of Island Studies was commissioned to do this report, and it was the cover, the lackluster cover belies its content. It was 
the most comprehensive uh, report that had been done on um, population in Prince Edward Island to that point. And it was island-wide consultations with stakeholders and with um, regular citizens from all across the island. We had, I don't know how many focus groups that we did, chaired by the wonderful Frank Ledwell, who was a well-respected poet and English professor at UBEI. He knew everybody, everybody knew him, and it was a really grassroots kind of um, um, attempt to try and figure out what people thought about growing our population. There were ended up being 55 recommendations um, that took a holistic approach encompassing a broad spectrum of ways by which PEI could grow its population. Um, some of the headlines included the role of communities, uh, the role of economic development, children, youth and seniors, education, health, transportation, housing, land use and development planning, and immigration, both interprovincial and international. And there was even a category called Islanders Away. And so this is where we're coming in. Over the years, since then, in the 18 years, there have been a myriad of reports that have based their work on the population strategy and built on it. Those are just a couple of them. And the 2000 report that we did um, has been referred to in, in many of them because it really was a basic um, document. So just a couple of statistics as of July 1st, PEI's population, 153,244. There's been a yearly increase of um, just over 2,500 persons for an annual 1.8% growth. This was the highest growth rate among the provinces tied with Ontario. Um, Yukon and Nunavut saw growth of 2.1 and 2.2% respectively. And PEI's two-year growth rate 2016 to 2018 at 4.3% leads all provinces and is behind only Yukon at 5%. So how did we grow our population? Um, a lot of it had to do with, well, a, a tiny, you know, a few more births and deaths um, as our exploding schools will show in Prince Edward Island. We're having a bit of a school crisis at the moment. We're also having a housing crisis at the moment. Um, we had several immigrants come in, um, international mostly, uh, through um, the, what we call the Provincial Nominee Program, as well as taking in some refugees. And you can see that we've had some interprovincial in and interprovincial out. And over the um, last few years, this year shows that um, the net was um, a negative, but in the two years previous, it was a positive. We had more interprovincial people coming in. As a footnote, I'm one of those people, came in 35 years ago from British Columbia, got off the boat and said, this is home, and uh, have made a life for myself on Prince Edward Island. There's some um, of the figures that went with the, um, the um, graphs, and all of these can be found on the PEI governments in their reports that I will be showing you in a minute. There's one of them, a framework for economic growth and population is one of the things. So as you can imagine, on a small island with few natural resources beyond agriculture, fisheries and tourism, prosperity depends on its people. And government has been quite conscious of growing our population over the last number of years, as evidenced by the 2000 report. The latest then is this one, the Mighty Island, a framework for economic growth. These were some of the um, um, topics that they covered in there. Um, again, trying to get at the issue of population and how everything kind of, you know, works together in a holistic framework. At the bottom there we have immigration and welcoming communities. These are some of the pages from this report talking about um, what they were um, going for when they were talking about population. And the priority of immigration and welcoming communities and the plan. Most of this seems to revolve around immigration from international, but there's a small section in there in the fine print that um, talks about interprovincial um, immigration, and that is the focus then of this recruit, retain, repatriate. And so we're going after repatriate in this um, talk because what we were trying to do was how do we attract some of our people back home. 
Again, I'm a case in point. I have two daughters. They are age 32 and 28. They grew up in Prince Edward Island, born there. Both of them live away. One is in England, where she teaches high school English, has married and has a child. The other is in Fort McMurray. She is a speech language pathologist, has been up there three years. And of the two, I think she'll be the one to come back. She has married a Cape Bretoner, and they named their dog Eileen. I figured if anybody that names their dog after, you know, with the word island in it, they're coming home. So I sent the, um, when, I'll get to it in a minute, how we ended up doing the survey, but I did send it to both of them and they both responded. I would love to have read them, but of course we couldn't because it was all um, confidential. So with our current population, um, I had mentioned it's 100, what was it, 153,244. The plan is to have it be 150,000 by the year 2022. And this is against the backdrop of out-migration of young people and in-migration of older residents. Indirectly, the government is saying the job is to promote PEI around the globe as a place to make a home, make business environment as attractive as possible. And one of the quotes that I liked, we are primarily a rural province and proudly so. Island residents also benefit from easy access to our largest centers. So scale is something that we um, have going for us very, very strongly. Our premier, um, Wade McLaughlin, talks about Prince Edward Island being a place that you can get your arms around. And if you've been to PEI, you'll know what I mean. So in the, oops, here we go. There were several priorities that were in the, mentioned in the, um, in the strategy. And to not only attract them, but to retain them. We do get a fair number of immigrants come in under the PNP program, and over the years, many have left. Many have stayed as well and um, availed themselves of the great education system, the, the scale of the place, the friendliness of our, of our island, but just as many have left um, because they just find that they want to be in larger urban centers where there are more people from their own countries where they won't feel quite so isolated. Um, so, in early January, the Institute of Island Studies was approached to put, take on this um, project by the Department of Workforce and Advanced Learning. So, it was to determine the opportunities for and barriers to islanders returning home, and part of the government's efforts to do evidence-based policy making. And as researchers here, we, we like to be part of that kind of a, of a um, a mindset, right? Let's make policy based on our research and the evidence. So in tandem with their staff, um, Jim and I designed a 26 question survey using SurveyMonkey that would go to alumni from University of Prince Edward Island, Holland College, and the, we also sent a French language version to Collège de Lille. Um, and we got, well, a link was also posted to the Work PEI Facebook page and was sent through the Institute of Island Studies communications channel. So it's difficult to know how many exactly it went to, but um, of the alumni, I think we were up at about 15,000, but then through other means of people forwarding it, etc., it could have gone a lot further. Um, the participants could include their email addresses if they wish to be contacted for follow-up focus groups and also to have it to go into a draw for two gift boxes, chock a block full of good PEI swag. An islander was identified as, quote, someone who lived or visited the island but currently does not live on PEI. By the closing date, March 15th, we had received 683 responses. The questions included closed and open-ended questions. And uh, so we were able to collect all the data using SurveyMonkey and uh, SPSS. We were able to do the um, tabulations and um, submit, wrote and submitted the report, which was designed and uploaded to the PEA government website. And it cost them just over $10,000 for, for us to do this work. So what I've done here is about, oh, um, included about 15 of the, well, maybe not that many, a dozen of the questions, like this is, for instance, what is your connection to PEI? Not surprisingly, because so many of the people uh, we sent it to were graduates of university, about 72% went to college or university in PEI, and many grew up, were born on, worked there, vacationed, all in that same number, and some continue to have a summer home. What were the main factors influencing your decision to leave? 
mostly work. As you can imagine, we hear this story all the time all across Canada. Several went away for education to other universities around across the country and out, out, um, beyond. 21% wanted to change, some left their family, and some were only on PEI for a short time anyway. But they continued, they decided that they wanted to fill out the report or the survey anyway. What is it about PEI that makes you interested in moving back? Lifestyle is the talk, the talk. And if anyone can, those people who've been to PEI, you might relate because lifestyle is a pretty amazing, good quality of life on Prince Edward Island. What might be impeding your return? Well, 30% jobs, not surprisingly. Costs associated with moving, etc. Only 8% saying nothing impeding their return. Why are you not interested in moving back to PEI? Um, that seems a little odd. 30% of the long ones, 60%, 42-12. It might be a little off there. You might have to talk to the people that designed it. But anyway, it seems that it mostly were job-related uh, reasons that they um, would, would not want to return. Uh, what's necessary in coming back? Again, a job. Salary is right up there. If you're up in Fort McMurray making over, you know, $150,000 to $100,000 a year, you're not going to find very rarely that you'll find that kind of a um, high paying job in Prince Edward Island. How connected do you feel, do you feel to uh, Prince Edward Island? You can see that almost half are, are quite, you know, fairly, no, as fairly connected, slightly, extremely, not at all. And then there's our demographic information and whether they're working full time, most of them were. This is where the people were living when they responded. Most of the respondents were from Ontario and then the next from Alberta. We also had two questions of um, open-ended questions. This was when I got what I um, love doing is, is doing the analysis of, of these, doing um, figuring out what the, the themes were, doing some word counts, thing, figuring out what were some of the um, issues that uh, were most foremost on people's minds. So why participants might want to move back to PEI seemed could group it into about five different categories. So your family, a good place to raise a family, lifestyle, um, I like that work-life balance is more important than money. Geography, more beaches, ocean, breathtaking landscapes, financial or employment related, the positive side. I think there's progress occurring on PEI that I would like to be part of. I love that. I miss the pace of life. I'm seeing all the great things happening in arts and culture, economic development, infrastructure. I'm sad to be missing out on it. There's some more of the comments. Um, no place like home, especially when it's an island. This was the air, the love, my family, his family, our son's family. Some of it was quite poetic, actually. And you could feel the yearning coming through in some of their words. There is no place on earth better than PEI. It's almost sounding like Stomp and Tom, right? Um, there was also the question, um, what might be preventing participants from moving back to PEI? There's the job situation. I love living on PEI, but I can't make a living on PEI. Healthcare, there were um, a lot of complaints about our, our healthcare, our limited healthcare. We have a doctor shortage. Lots of people are on doctor waiting lists to, to get a position. Cost of living. Um, I think there was another one there too. Okay, question 23, 24. There is the education, childcare, uh, the small town politics, the who you know situations, and the constant unknown of people's education field. So, this was a teacher. Uh, geography, high travel costs, etc. cetera. A bit too isolated for, for the rest of the world. This was a long list of uh, the, some of the negative things about Prince Edward Island. Um, I think this is, could be found in pretty nearly any community, in, um, anywhere. Um, I like the uh, earwigs and mosquitoes. <laughs> We also, um, when I was going through the qualitative, um, people would say, well, if you had this job, then I would come back. So I was able to harvest a whole bunch of jobs that people might um, come, if they were available, might come back to. Uh, 
polygraph examiner. I don't know, it's a little specialized. As part of the, um, I will just mention that workforce and advanced learning did not request much in the way of cross tabulations except for this one. Um, those who indicated they would come home by either their sector of interest or where they live now with the goal to target more advertising or consider recruiting to specific individuals. So I don't know if they followed up on that or if they've done it. The report was released as part of their strategy to profile those who moved back. And there were a few um, videos online that you can find as part of their um, the strategy. And again, very poignant stories from people who have decided to move back. Um, this is a, a Dr. Christine Campbell. This was a fellow who started his own tuck and roll vintage clothing. And there's a, a lovely video on there that um, it's about 12 minutes long that uh, tells their story. So um, they also, as part of the release, included a prize of a one-way ticket home to Prince Edward Island. Um, we were surprised that it did not receive much in the way of critical analysis from the media. There were lots of stories about it, but nothing really critical from our CBC or The Guardian. I'll just finish up by wondering the implications for rural communities. Um, how can this data be used to help build healthy and prosperous communities? Because that's, again, this evidence-based research that we're trying to offer. Um, for instance, is it possible to incentivize setting up businesses in our rural communities where housing costs are lower, quality of life based on community values is strong, where people who want to return to the island can purchase land or house and can build a life? So it's getting people outside of the urban centers of Charlottetown and Summerside into the communities. And we're seeing a little bit of this. Um, one of the people who was interviewed in this video was um, open a brewery in Montague. And uh, I think by all accounts, they're doing really, really well, called Copper Bottom Brewery. There are a couple others in rural Canada, or rural PEI as well, craft, getting, cashing in on the, the craft beer uh, craze. Um, is it possible to strengthen broadband so people can work remotely and contribute to their communities? Is it possible to incorporate retirees with their often vast life experience who want to return to the island into the workforce or the volunteer se sector? And how can the PEI government address these concerns about good jobs, housing, childcare, health, and open-mindedness? Finally, I'll just end with a tiny bit of pushback. For instance, after this came out um, in the last few weeks, um, the IRAC, our Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission, approved a 1.5 um, increase, rent increase, and our rental, um, the market in Charlottetown right now is less than a 1% vacancy rate. So this is what one of the comments was, give your heads a shake. Um, many commentators, uh, commenters were frustrated with the maximum allowable residential rent increases, particularly while the capital faces a housing crunch. Mackenzie Ross says, I find it funny how the PEI government has this campaign to bring Islanders back to PEI, all the while we have an extremely low vacancy rental rate and now IRAC approved a rental price increase. Give your heads a shake. What is there to come back to? So in the end, I think what's needed is this very much, again, returning to that holistic approach where all the pieces are working together, doing our best to make sure that one lines up with the other, that lines up with the other. That's just my opinion as a Prince Edward Islander, not necessarily as a researcher, but um, that's just, I can be both. So I thank you and uh, happy to take questions when the time comes. Thank you, Laurie, that was great. Um, now we have our last presenter to call up. So I'd like to uh, welcome Mikael Hellstrom to the uh, podium. He comes from the University of New Brunswick and his uh, presentation is titled Refugees in New Brunswick Experiences of the Settlement Process. Thank you. I'm from uh, the University of New Brunswick, St. John, which was a bit of a discussion there. Otherwise, I would be assumed to be from Fredericton, and that is not the case. There's an entire hour between the two cities. Um, that, that's a far distance in St. James. Um, I came to this from the point of view of immigration and refugee settlement. Um, my previous work has been on uh, immigrant agency specifically. Now, when I say immigrant agency, I mean um, how immigrants and immigrant communities come together identify their own needs, organize, and start delivering 
programming for their own communities to, to satisfy those needs. And uh, my previous research actually focused on, on the larger cities, like so many of my colleagues. So Toronto and Vancouver and comparing that to uh, Europe and um, how the public management models that have been used by different governments have allowed or obstructed those initiatives from immigrant communities. And so that's how I have come to New Brunswick um, and to uh, study the situation there. And that means that um, issues of rural revitalization are fairly new to me, but uh, issues of immigrant settlement aren't. And to learn more, there. Uh, to learn more about um, the conditions for immigrant settlement outside the major cities, I uh, had to do some homework uh, when I uh, arrived in St. John uh, about more than a year ago. And um, some of these, these issues that are confronting New Brunswick specifically uh, are things that you will not find in Toronto or Vancouver. So uh, I notice here, for instance, that New Brunswick is a province with a population decline. It's the only province in confederation with this particular problem. And uh, the provincial government is then looking to refugees, for instance, and immigrants in general, um, to increase the population. Uh, what we have as a problem then is a decreasing uh, population and increasing the aging population uh, steadily decreasing tax base in the province. Uh, we just had a provincial election, and interestingly enough, um, none of the politicians were talking about that particular issue of immigration and so on. Uh, there is a sense among those of us who, who work with uh, immigration and uh, refugee settlement in the province that maybe they are not talking about it because they are fearing a backlash from the population. Um, that maybe New Brunswickers are unaware of this uh, demographic imperative you know, uh, and uh, would like to see increased immigration. But in terms of uh, the provincial uh, public economics, there is really um, no math. Uh, we have to attract more people to the province or we will face uh, serious decline in the tax base and how we will be able to then provide public services uh, to an increasing age of the population. So uh, when I sat down to look at and ask uh, the refugees who came, primarily the Syrian refugees, but also others, uh, to New Brunswick over the past three years, um, I first uh, wanted to compare with the research on immigration refugee settlement in other areas outside major metropolitan areas, let's say. So I looked at uh, studies, uh, not too many studies, I'll have to say. Most of my colleagues, like me, have previously been focusing on the major metropolitan areas because that's where mo most of the migrants go internationally. Um, but there's studies from Australia, Portugal, other parts of Canada um, on uh, what happened to immigrants who tried to settle outside major metropolitan areas and the challenges they faced. And uh, I'll summarize some of those, these findings here. This is from studies over the past decade or two, um, issues of employment. We've seen this, this as a theme here from, from previous panelists. Uh, issues of services, uh, issues of education. For instance, uh, cases in uh, rural Alberta where immigrants would come, but they would decide to leave those locales because they their children to have easy access to post-secondary education in that particular place that you have it. Um, also, family re reunification is something that, that uh, has been brought up as a theme in previous uh, research. Now, that's not something that New Brunswick can actually, as a province, do much about because it's a federal issue. Um, but it is a theme the, that uh, refugees would care about. Uh, and housing, which is also, not maybe the, the biggest issue in New Brunswick as such, but we'll get back to, to exactly what the refugees said. Um, so the question here I'm asking is how, how, if we compare what the refugees that I talked to, um, how they found their settlement process with these, with these findings, what do we find that is consistent and uh, what uh, do we find that are 
sort of unique for me. Uh, this uh, is uh, part of my, my postdoctoral fellowship. Um, I am working in uh, several stages in this. Uh, for this particular paper, I uh, interviewed, uh, I used qualitative research, research methods and talked to about 40 participants from uh, Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John. Uh, and uh, while that would count as urban regions in New Brunswick, uh, when it comes to Canada, uh, it counts as fourth tier cities, so certainly outside the major, major metropolitan areas, and all of New Brunswick would be seen as remote from that perspective. Um, for the most part, I did semi-structured uh, semi interviews, though I did uh, do a, a sort of a spontaneous focus group in Fredericton. Uh, this is because of how I reached out to, to the participants. Uh, I worked through the settlement agencies and uh, community leaders uh, who brokered the connection to the, the uh, interviewees. And um, in one case, um, it sort of turned out to be a focus group because of um, the, the physical structures of the room. I just couldn't interview people individually. There were 20 people who wanted to talk to me, and um, I sort of had to go with the, the situation. Um, another note here, 80% of the participants in these interviews in the focus group were, were male. Uh, and the people I talked to, uh, both in the service agencies and refugees themselves, would say that this is very much because of um, the, the sort of gender relations within the community, where uh, the man is the traditional breadwinner, and uh, very much focused on more focused on, if you will, uh, finding a job uh, where the uh, uh, woman is uh, expected to, to be a homemaker. Um, so that is the reason for, for this uh, quite skewed sample. Now, uh, for occupational backgrounds, uh, this is a long list and uh, it goes from various uh, levels of education from account coordinators, and I have some computer scientists, I have uh, engineers, uh, but also uh, blue color backgrounds, bricklayers, bus drivers, uh, carpenters, uh, tailors. Um, some had a few years of experience, others had up to 20 years of experience. And the point with this slide is really to demonstrate that uh, in many cases, these are people with a long career behind them. And that relates di directly to some of the challenges they face with the settlement in New Brunswick. So I've noticed here uh, for the women, most of them homemakers, uh, quite a few of them were, uh, that I talked to were talking about that they wanted to find a job here as well. Uh, because the background and because of how the family structures had been before um, entering Canada, uh, they spoke mostly about the type of professions where they could draw on this experience as homemakers. So uh, cooking in a restaurant kitchen, for instance, because they had been cooking at home for a bunch of families, or entering childcare professions. Uh, but there were also others with, with um, uh, what we would call uh, sort of educational professions of teachers, tailors, civil engineer. Um, so again, it, it varies. And again, uh, all of them would say that they had experience that was relevant from their perspective for some kind of career. Um, this is way too small for anyone to see. I managed to do that. Um, this is a list of the services that they appreciated on landing in Canada. Um, and when it came to all three cities, they we're very happy. Oh, see, you can, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm used to working with Prezi where I would submit an app, so sorry about that. Um, they all appreciate very much the translation services offered upon arrival. Uh, one uh, common uh, denominator among most of the refugees uh, from Syria specifically uh, was a very low level of English training on entering the country. Some uh, were even illiterate in Arabic. So learning English from scratch was quite a challenge for them. 
and thus uh, getting those translation services during the first year was very, very much. Um, and this also goes to um, facilitation with a series of uh, elements of living in, in Canada that the native one would take for granted, like how to operate a an electric stove, um, or how to go uh, shopping for groceries at Sobeys. Um, these were experiences that were new to quite a few of the respondents, and they were very, very happy that they had uh, been introduced to that and how to open a bank account, and certainly how to get in touch with the medical services, healthcare. Um, in some cases, uh, the several certain agencies have also assisted with transportation. So volunteers would come with a car and drive them where they had to go in the end, the initial stages of settlement. And all that we very much appreciated and um, helped their initial period in Canada immensely. Now, there were also frustrations, uh, quite a few. So the longer they had been, uh, the, the more frustrations they had uncovered. And this would summarize uh, quite a few of those. Uh, first of all, hard finding jobs. We see that again as a theme. Uh, that goes, of course, for, for uh, refugees and immigrants, regardless of um, uh, whether they're Syrians or from other uh, places. Uh, not enough ESL is something they commented on. Uh, in many cases, they spoke about how they only had three hours of as a second language courses per week, and they wanted at least double that, if not more. Um, when I, the, the, speaking to the, most of these uh, respondents, they were very eager to begin their life in earnest as uh, self-sustaining, economically self-sustaining, self-sufficient uh, Canadians. And uh, part of that was they knew that they needed to learn English so when the programming in English language uh, proposed to them uh, was for several years in some cases, uh, that made them very frustrated. They wanted to learn English faster. And for different reasons, um, that had not been possible to arrange. Um, in some cases also, they were critiquing uh, the um, structure of ESL and the contents. So, um, they were saying that uh, the English language training was more directed towards the citizenship tests and becoming Canadian citizens. Uh, but what they wanted was something that was more relevant for their everyday life. For instance, uh, they wanted to learn uh, English that could help them speak to doctors and nurses when they access healthcare. So they didn't have to rely on translators. Um, and to learn occupationally specific English so they could get into the labor market faster. Um, and they felt that the, the structure that they had to achieve English language benchmark level four for a whole lot of, of occupationally specific English training uh, was also a frustration. So that there are too many courses to enter the labor market uh, and that this entire period could take four, five, six years for some, depending on how quickly they could learn. Um, many of them who wanted to, to uh, start working immediately uh, found that in Canada there are a lot of regulations around uh, occupations, occupational regulations and certification processes. And this is a common theme for immigrant, immigrants all over Canada, refugees or not. Um, in the literature, we've talked about this for about a couple of decades now, about how foreign qualifications and credentials are not sufficiently recognized in this country. So it's not quite a, a surprise that um, the refugees to New Brunswick uh, find this a, a barrier as well. Uh, and I had a couple of interesting comments, for instance, um, I noticed here, failing the test even by a little often requires redoing the whole training period. So there was a bricklayer who had, uh, I think it was 84% correct at the certification test. Uh, and he was quite willing to do the training for the rest of the, that he had failed on that test. So the rest of the 15% or 16% that, that was outstanding. Uh, but because he failed by, by that margin, uh, he was required to do the entire training. It's as if his entire occupational 
career didn't count at all. That was deeply frustrating. No. So basically, they want their foreign experience recognized. And this is not to suggest that they were, and they didn't suggest it either, that they were ready to start working uh, in Canada from day one. Uh, but they felt that it was uh, too little recognition of the competencies that they did have uh, when uh, coming in contact with the Canadian system for qualifications. For so they suggested the improvements of the systems. Uh, and this is basically the, the major four areas uh, that these improvements, these, these suggestions were clustered around. Uh, they wanted uh, more hours of ESL because they wanted to learn English faster so they could get onto the system and um, uh, get into the labor market faster. Uh, they wanted to have ESL courses for specific occupational streams and specific everyday needs. Again, the help English for uh, patients or English for truck drivers. One of the uh, people I talked to in Fredericton was talking about how um, he was well aware that he had a long career as a truck driver from Syria, but uh, of course he had to be able to speak to dispatch and he didn't have enough English to do that. So he wanted a course specific truck driver so he could start driving the truck again. Um, uh, there were also, since many of them had a fairly low level of formal education, so we're talking maybe six or seven years in many cases, uh, they were not really used to sitting in classrooms, and they felt very frustrated with sitting in classrooms, and sometimes uh, they felt that it sort of challenged their self-esteem, if you will, uh, and uh, many of them described how they would rather learn English while working. Uh, that was at all possible. So uh, they, they recognized that they needed English in Canada. There was an unwillingness to learn the language. It was uh, a suggestion of why, why can't we uh, begin in a position to learn English while we work, would have some kind of salary, and then advance. Um, so uh, one of the young men I spoke to had managed to find an entry level uh, position in Moncton. Uh, where the manager uh, spoke Arabic and had hired quite a few uh, in the community there at entry level positions. So they didn't require English to start there, but they learned English on the go, on the job there. It was not, uh, it, the certification issue was not a problem for that particular workplace. And because of that, he was able to, to build his English skills together with the manager and the other people there and also get Canadian work experience. And that added to his CV later on, move on to other uh, employers with credentials, a reference, and improved English skills. And that's something that he suggested that, that um, it was to, to be made into a more systematic way, entryway into the labor market. For languages. And there were also people who were uh, arguing that maybe they could do the professional testing in Arabic. Uh, they felt that the tests as they existed were more a test of their English levels rather than their actual skill levels. Um, and uh, potentially they could start in some kind of uh, learner position or have a, a conditional uh, certification pending further English uh, education and development of their professional language, but at least start working in some kind of entry position and earn their own so they didn't want to be stuck in that particular system uh, for too long. And finally, uh, I asked them if they wanted to stay in New Brunswick or not. And uh, because, of course, the, the whole issue here is the population decline of the province. And for uh, most of them, uh, the major uh, sort of push factor prompting them to leave the province was jobs. It's a failure. Uh, but when it came to factors that made them want to stay, um, they spoke about the public services, healthcare, and so on. But they also spoke about quality of life and uh, low cost of living and the welcoming people. So they were very, very happy with the Brunswickers and how the Brunswickers had volunteered to help them out in the original stay. They always spoke quite well of uh, nice New Brunswickers. 
uh, so there quite a few of them spoke about how New Brunswick would be a great place to raise a family, probably like much like Peter Dye. Um, but the, the issue was the jobs. And uh, quite a few were examples. They spoke about how um, uh, they moved to Montreal or Toronto uh, to find jobs. So um, conclusions then. Uh, like in previous literature, uh, they're mostly worried about jobs. And really that's, that's the, the theme and the problem for New Brunswick. And that's why many people have left New Brunswick in the per first place is where are the job opportunities? Um, but unlike the, the other research I, I looked at when it came to these types of areas, um, the respondents here emphasize the welcoming communities as a great reason to stay. That's not a factor that I found in a lot of the other studies. And also the low cost of living and, and the high quality of uh, They have been quite happy with the welcoming services on arrival. So the, what the settlement agencies have done in terms of organizing volunteers and so on and so forth have been much appreciated. The problems here was really about the system for uh, foreign credentials recognition and the, the, the pathway into a job. And that's a theme across Canada. So uh, it's not necessarily unique for New Brunswick. But unlike the other provinces, New Brunswick hasn't had a whole lot of tradition with immigration uh, and uh, refugee settlement, unless we, we count that wave of loyalists uh, that came and founded the city of St. John just after the American Revolution. Um, the, so there is an opportunity here for the province, I would argue, uh, to design settlement systems, take into account these experiences and narratives, and maybe avoiding some of the systemic barriers that have been developed in other provinces. Um, if we're building bridging programs from scratch in Brunswick, and that's what we want to have to do, um, then uh, there's no reason to make the same mistakes that have happened elsewhere. Uh, so I feel there's uh, definitely uh, ways uh, that we can improve the services. And uh, looking outside what I've done for this particular paper, um, the provincial government and many of the stakeholders in the province are uh, very much discussing this issue and uh, launching initiatives now to uh, try to uh, solve some of these systemic issues and retain people to come and increase uh, immigration to the province. And um, I think I'll stay there. Thank you so much to our panel. That was excellent. So thank you all to our presenters. Uh, thank you for tuning in, those on the uh, webinar. So thank you. Good afternoon.